Welcome everybody to the uh, Nonprofit Capacity Building in a Time of COVID, hosted by Lightful. I'm Beth Cantor. I'm a senior advisor to Lightful. I'm a trainer, um, virtual facilitator and author, and I'll be your moderator today. We will be discussing uh, nonprofit capacity building and how it's rapidly evolving during a pandemic, financial crisis, and global racial equity movement. Um, and we'll be talking about how it's evolved through uh, all the phases of reaction, pivoting, and finally reinvention. So a quick definition of capacity building. Um, many of us, when we think about um, funders, we often think that they provide uh, just financial uh, report. But funders also provide capacity support, which helps nonprofits gain skills, um, helps their organizations achieve more impact, or can help um, begin to shift a system. And capacity building activities include um, things like trainings, consultants, coaching, peer learning models, and they could be in depth or short term. Um, but today, um, uh, we'll be talking about some particular capacity building uh, models. And our speakers include um, Akruti Dusai, Senior Program Officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And she will share uh, the Gates Foundation's approach um, uh, to capacity building during a time of COVID um, and their strategy uh, for investing in the digital space. She'll be joined by Alex Guerrer, uh, who is the CEO at Global Giving and Lightful CEO and co-founder, Vinay Nair. Um, both will share insights into what they're both learning from their uh, digital capacity building programs, which uh, were designed as digital first. So they have a lot of insights here to share. After the presentation, we will open it up for Q&A and discussion. So please uh, use that Q&A panel throughout the um, presentation and we will queue up your questions and, uh, and, and integrate them into the discussion. Uh, just so you know um, that, uh, that there will be a recording and you'll get a copy of the slides afterwards. So, um, and so this is our agenda. We're going to start with an audience poll. Uh, we're going to hear uh, from Akruti, uh, followed by presentations and, and discussion. So let's queue up the audience polls. <laughs> so the first poll, we want to know a little bit about you. Are you a charity, nonprofit, or social enterprise? Are you a foundation or other type of funder? Are you a governmental body or something else? So uh, you'll see the audience poll um, and click there. Um, and then the magicians behind the scenes, <laughs> once enough of you have answered the poll, uh, will launch it and share it. Right. So we're going to go on to our next poll. Are you and your organization currently participating in hosting or funding a capacity building program for uh, nonprofits? Yes, no, or thinking about it. We'll give uh, fo uh, folks a chance to answer it. I know there's a lot of you on the call, so it may take some time to tabulate. And then we'll move on to our next question. Okay, so our, our third question, third poll, is in thinking about how your organization pivoted programs, services, events, communications, and fundraising uh, to digital since COVID-19, how confident and competent are you in your digital capabilities? Not at all, a little bit, somewhat, or most of the time, all of the time, uh, sort of can't really answer that. And we'll give a chance to have the questions tabulated and shared with our audience. Okay. 
before we move on to our presentation. Oh, great. So let, let's move on to our first panelist, who is Akruti Dusai, um, who is the Senior Program Officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And she's going to share um, the Gates Foundation's approach uh, during a time of COVID and strategy in investing in a capacity building in the digital space. So I will hand it over to Akruti. Thank you so much, Beth. And thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Akruti Desai, or Akruti Desai for all the South Asians on the call. And I'm a senior program officer with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on the Philanthropic Partnerships team. First, before I get started, I want to apologize in advance for any dog barking you may hear in the background. It's all a part of the joys and frustrations of working from home. Uh, second, uh, many of the data points on giving that I will quote um, will be from a US context. We're working closely with Indiana University to get better global data on giving, but for the purposes of this conversation, I will mostly be speaking to trends in the US. That said, I think you could probably extrapolate some of those trends globally as well. As a funder in this space, I'd like to touch on a few different topics, starting with a high level look at the ecosystem and the current giving environment. The best adage I've heard about the time we're currently in is we're all in the same storm, but we have very different boats. As of last night, we've reached over 10 million cases and over half a million deaths globally due to COVID-19. In the US, we know that this disease is disproportionately affecting communities of color. I would be remiss not to mention the work of my colleagues in the Global Health Division of the Gates Foundation and their response to COVID. In total, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has committed $250 million to COVID-19 response with a focus on four areas. First, protecting the most vulnerable. Second, accelerating detection and containment of the virus. Third, developing treatments and a vaccine. And fourth, minimizing societal and economic impact. More relevant to this discussion is the impact of COVID-19 on donors and nonprofits. Recent results from the Fundraising Effectiveness Project based on a sample of nearly 2,500 nonprofits in the US and Canada found that individual giving dropped 6% in the first quarter of 2020. But donations under $250 increased 6%. The everyday donor is inspired to give and is doing just that. While we don't know what the prolonged presence of COVID-19 will do to philanthropy, we do know from historical data that giving levels are strongly correlated to the economy. So a looming recession could reduce revenue for nonprofits at a time when they need it most. In addition, the way in which nonprofits use to raise funds, such as through events and in-person galas, will have to shift online. According to the most recent Blackbaud report in 2018, only 8.7% of giving was conducted online. Anecdotally, I've heard partners recount stories of how their staff can't access office buildings and the checks of well-meaning donors are going undeposited. And while online giving grows incrementally every year, a recent give.org survey conducted after COVID-19 hit found 57% of respondents are looking to find new or expanded ways to raise funds online. I just threw a bunch of numbers at you, but basically what I'm saying here is we have a perfect storm where potentially overall giving could be declining and the traditional ways in which nonprofits raise funds is no longer available. The pandemic and its domino effects are forcing people to change how they give and forcing nonprofits to change how they raise much needed funding. The team I sit on, the Philanthropic Partnerships team, aims to increase generosity. In short, we want to increase the quality and quantity of giving by all people, from the wealthiest billionaires to the everyday giver. 
we are a unique team at the foundation that is not specialized in one of our 30 plus issue areas like HIV, malaria, agriculture. We are sector agnostic and invest in the philanthropic infrastructure with a grant making portfolio that covers policy, data, experimentation, and products and tools for donors. Some of our grantees include the National Council on Nonprofits, Indiana University's Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, Candid, which is the recently merged entity of formerly GuideStar and Foundation Center, uh, Giving Tuesday, and Charity Navigator as just examples of a handful of grantees in our current portfolio. My work focuses on how we can help the everyday donor, <clears throat> excuse me, the everyday donor, you know, the non-billionaire, non-Bill Gates type of donor, uh, be informed and intentional in their giving. As you can imagine, reaching the everyday donor in a one-to-one -one fashion just isn't feasible. So the bulk of our strategy focuses on working through various online intermediaries, such as donor advised funds like Fidelity Charitable, workplace giving platforms like Benevity, and aggregation platforms like Global Giving. Through these intermediaries, we can run experiments and test concepts to better understand what helps everyday donors give more and give better. And ultimately, we can then help scale promising products and tools and features through these intermediaries to reach more donors. All of that said, we know from the data that the vast majority of giving doesn't currently go through intermediaries. In fact, we estimate that nearly 75% of funds go directly from donors to nonprofits. Since giving directly to nonprofits remains the most popular way for donors to give, we realized we needed to find ways to strengthen the capacity of nonprofits to engage with donors. It was around this time that we were introduced to Lightful. We were impressed by their technology and provided some initial funding to pilot their bridge program. In true Gates fashion, we wanted to pilot to produce data and evidence ideally with A-B testing and statistically significant results, uh, that the program truly increased a nonprofit's capacity to digitally fundraise. At the end of the pilot, it was found that participants in the bridge program were able to increase their fundraising 44% over those who did not participate. And please, Vinay, correct me if I'm wrong on that statistic. Um, due to the positive results from the pilot, we have provided another round of funding to Lightful to expand its bridge program to reach even more nonprofits. This decision could not have been more well-timed. Shortly after the most recent grant was approved, COVID-19 hit and nonprofits and donors everywhere scrambled to figure out how to adjust to the new environment. To meet the needs of the time, we worked with Lightful to expedite funding and accelerate the timeline to begin the first bridge cohort earlier than planned. We are so happy that our funding is going to an evidence-based program during a time when digital fundraising is more critical than ever. Thank you. Great. Thank you uh, so much, Akruti, for uh, that overview and presentation. And I, I have a follow-up question. Um, uh, you, you mentioned um, that uh, the Gates Foundation in, invests in um, <clears throat> evidence-based uh, programs and um, and the sort of uh, 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 investing in the kind of capacity building side of it. Um, of course, some of the evidence that you were looking at to see if something worked was, you know, a percentage increase in fundraising. I'm wondering if you could share um, some of the other indicators uh, that you saw in the data. I mean, that's the ultimate one, right? More money raised or a, a percentage of money raised, but there must be other I guess, uh, interim indicators that you saw. Absolutely. I think, um, and I'll, I'll speak more broadly than even just our work with Lightful and the Bridge program in terms of how we think about metrics and how we might want to measure effectiveness. Um, you know, we obviously, dollars is kind of the, it's the, that final step, but there's so many other intermediate steps that donors need to go through before they might be able to get to that place where they hit the donate button. So there are a handful of metrics around engagement that we find really um, important. Um, number of clicks, um, other types of engagement, whether with the nonprofit or, or on a specific cause area, that could be volunteering, 
signing petitions. Maybe these are people that aren't um, able to give right now, but they're finding other ways to donate their time and donate their skills. Um, so there are a lot of engagement metrics that we think are really important and paint the broader picture of what generosity means and what ultimately it takes to get a person to move dollars into a nonprofit. Absolutely, equity, and it's an important reminder for us, um, all of us in the sector who are uh, engaged in fundraising, either from uh, the platform side or the nonprofit side, that uh, it's not just about the dollars, although the dollars are very important now, and that we have to remember uh, it, that engagement is really uh, essential. And of course, social media is one channel for engagement. There was a, another question, uh, a clarification, and uh, it's a kind of data question, <laughs> and. Um, so put on your data scientist hat. Um, uh, did you look at causality in the uh, data or in the change? In the change of giving during COVID? Sorry, or the... Um, that's just what the question here says. I imagine that they, I'm going to put myself and do some uh, mental mind meld of this person's question. <laughs> And I'm going to assume that they're asking, uh, you know, what it, uh, between the different engagement metrics that you just laid out, mm -hmm. um, is there causality between those and increased giving, that being the change? Yeah, that's a great question. And I definitely, I myself am not a data scientist and we work with partners who have much more expertise in that space. I think what the data does tell, um, at least specifically to volunteering, giving time, that's the one that comes to mind. There is data that says there's causality there. I believe a volunteer is twice as uh, twice more likely to give to a nonprofit than a non-volunteer. Um, so there is evidence out there that engagement metrics do result in more giving. Um, in terms of click-through rates and all of that, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I think probably a lot of people have that question. I think there's also often that question of, well, why are people falling off? Is it a salience issue where, you know, uh, you're just not capturing someone's attention. Is it too many steps, too many things you have to click through to get to the donate page? All of those things um, we consider barriers for everyday givers. And we are through our various investments trying to um, simplify and reduce as many barriers for the everyday giver as possible. Great, thank you so much, Akruti. And in the interest of time, I'm gonna to move to our next speaker, but I'm also gonna mention, uh, there was a, a question in the chat asking about, do we have access to the data points mentioned? I will say that, that Gates does make a lot of its research publicly available and, and you'll get links to uh, where you can find some of those studies. I think not only are they valuable for platforms and intermediaries, but I think it's also value, valuable for nonprofits to know about. Um, so next up, we're gonna hear from Alex. Um, Guerrero, <laughs> hopefully I got it right. And he's gonna share some insights about their capacity building programs. Great, thanks Beth. Um, first, let me just say what a pleasure it is to be a part of this group. Uh, people that I like and admire uh, a great deal. Um, and I'm really happy to be able to share some of what we've been learning and thinking about and working on at uh, Global Giving over the last few months when so much has changed. Um, so if we go to my first slide, um, I'll start with a bit of an introduction to global giving for those of you who don't know us. Although if you don't know us, come get to know us. Come to our site, globalgiving.org, um, where you can see some of this in action. We are a giving platform and we connect um, nonprofits, individual donors, so some of these everyday donors that uh, Akriti was, uh, was mentioning, and companies, you know, corporate funders, uh, to support community-led projects um, pretty much everywhere in the world. We operate in 170 countries and we support and work with partners who are working in every sort of thematic area that you can imagine, whether that's um, climate change, uh, hunger, gender equality, racial equality, arts, et cetera. Um, and so sort of everywhere at the intersection of a location, and a particular interest. Um, we're working with a partner that um, in particular is community-led. That's what our mission is, to support those organizations that are most attuned to the needs of their community. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, I'll delve a little bit deeper because you know, I think for this discussion, um, 
we, as an organization, wear a few different organizational hats that give us a couple of different perspectives on how we can respond to um, the current trends. I mean, certainly the pandemic, um, recently the increased focus on racial injustice here in the US, um, as well as around the world, it turns out. Uh, and here are four of those hats that we wear. One is we are a nonprofit organization ourselves. We have a staff of 60 people, sort of small but mighty in a way. Um, um, and uh, we've had to respond just as an organization trying to operate in this environment with all these changes, just like every other nonprofit company, you know, trade group, et cetera. Um, and so certainly we've done some thinking about that. We are a funder in that we provide grants for our nonprofit partners and the dynamics around the pandemic and around, the, again, this focus on the oppression of black people in the US and other people of color, um, including around the world, have really caused us to think programmatically about what our response is as a funder. Um, we are a fundraiser. <laughs> um, and again, Akruthi uh, talked about some of the dynamics, both positive and negative. Um, and one of the major dynamics that, of course, every fundraiser is thinking about is not only the changes um, in how we can fundraise, but also just this incredible ongoing economic uncertainty, um, which sort of continues to loom large. It's already had a big impact and will continue to, to do so. Uh, lastly, we partner with nonprofits in ways that go beyond funding. Um, we are a capacity builder. Um, we deliver trainings, workshops, where we connect uh, communities of, of peer learners. Uh, and so we thought a lot about how to um, continue to build capacity uh, among our non nonprofit partners uh, in, in this time. So those are the four uh, that I'll, I'll talk through. And the next slide, uh, which we can move to, um, sort of summarizes the lessons from each one. You know, we have a short time, so I'll try to distill um, kind of one key point for, for each of these. Uh, the first is, you know, as an operator, as an operating nonprofit, as just an organization, uh, from the beginning of the major changes, you know, we started to feel the impact of the coronavirus, uh, the pandemic, and the changes to our norms, our working norms in March. Uh, and really the key word uh, for us has been flexibility from the start. And here we have a gif of sort of reeds bending in the wind to try to show how we've been trying to flex with the demands. And, you know, I think the key insight for us here has been that there's really no point in pretending that things could just go mostly as they were going before, uh, before January. There's no point in sort of engaging or entertaining that fiction. Instead, uh, it seemed much better to us to admit, hey, things are really different. For example, we have a lot of parents on staff. Uh, I'm a parent myself. And what we know is that the basic infrastructure that parents depend on, schools, childcare, to be able to then come to work and do their work, has been completely upset. And so since that's upset, that means our ability to engage professionally is dramatically changed. The inputs are changed, so the outputs have to change. And I think that that's something that we've tried to stress from the beginning. It's carried through in policies internally, um, as well as just changes in norms. And the governing word is flexibility. Let's be open as a staff to what our colleagues need and can do and, and can't do. Um, with an understanding that the outputs are going to be different. So, uh, so that's really the, the key insight there. Um, as a funder, we have found um, a lot of guidance in our North Star. A lot of organizations you know, define sort of a North Star that is the direction that, that they try to move in. For us, the North Star as a funder is that we don't want to get in the way of our nonprofit grantees doing their work. In other words, there are things that funders can do that inadvertently steal attention away towards themselves, um, cause nonprofits to actually work on behalf of the funder. And this is something that we very much don't want to do. We, we exist to serve our grantees, not the other way around. 
One example of that, you know, um, is that we launched a micro grant program at the beginning, started with $100,000, and we said, look, partners, we know that things are different now. No matter what you're doing, if you have a need, send us an email, three sentences, just describe your need, and you'll be immediately eligible for a $1,000 grant, which is a significant amount to, to many of our partners. Um, the response was huge. Uh, we were oversubscribed, um, and we started to see a real impact there. Um, so we've grown that program and now uh, are nearing 500,000, so 500 organizations with, with, with these grants. Um, and the key is just to make it as easy as possible. You're already doing a lot of work to both serve your communities and try to respond to the dynamics. So let us not increase the burden as simple as an email to make you eligible for a grant. Um, as a fundraiser, um, we have witnessed this, um, this uh, drive. Again, Akriti gave some indication of some of these trends that uh, this is a difficult time to fundraise, but it's also a time when there's a lot of interest and there's a drive on the part of the population as a whole to give and to give back and to give more. Uh, and actually what you could see in this chart is that in fact, over the last um, uh, half year, we have been fundraising, and this is money that we're raising on the part uh, on behalf of our nonprofit partners, uh, pretty much at a pace twice as much as last year. And almost all of that is driven by um, the desire of everyday donors and corporate partners to give in response to the pandemic. And what we found is that if you have an appeal that starts with empathy, this is a time when people you know, uh, there are a lot of dynamics going on, but one is that our better natures are, are coming out if just given an opportunity. And so if you reach out with um, empathy, and if you keep it real as a fundraiser, and what I mean by that if, is if you're just transparent about what's changed, what you can't do, what you can do, uh, be open about what your needs are. And we found that if you sort of close with care, with an understanding that actually even the donors themselves are experiencing need, that that messaging really resonates. Um, and so we, you know, we've worked with our nonprofit partners to engage in that sort of approach and, and we've seen it work. And then lastly, around capacity, um, we've turned to data. And I know that this chart is very hard to see, but we've been mining the emails that folks have sent us to see what our nonprofits need support in. And what we found is sort of three trends that I'll just quickly speak to. One is that um, uh, the nonprofits themselves, in, and it's headlined here as nonprofit needs, are experiencing need in capacity around every part of their just opera basic operational functioning. That's one. The second is that this gets to the different votes. Everybody is, has become keenly aware of the way that this pandemic has had a differential impact on most vulnerable populations, and that's come. Th that's been a message that's been incredibly salient in our conversations with our nonprofit partners, and so a focus there. And then, lastly, even those nonprofits that ostensibly are working on other theme areas have found some part of their programming oriented towards public health and the health needs of their community. Uh, and so, we've been working to build capacity in each of these areas. And then the last thing that I'll say, you know, on, on my last slide, um, the, the next slide, is that um, a word that's come up over and over and over again um, in conversations and webinars, et cetera, is unprecedented. Um, you know, we're, we find ourselves calling these times unprecedented. It's never happened before. Um, and what we think is that if we're going to call these times unprecedented, which they are, there's an implication which is that we better be prepared to do things that we've never done before. The context is like one that we've never done before. And so the response is gonna have to be one that's creative, um, cuts across sectors um, and innovative. Um, and so maybe I'll end there, Beth, and, and turn it over to you.
Great, thank you, Alex, for that great presentation. And also for the reminder of kind of like uh, four things for us to think about that I'm sure we'll dig into in the panel discussion, given time, but you know, the flexibility, um, centering grantees needs, radical empathy, and data, 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 um, decisions made by data, not by finger in the wind, if you will. Um, so uh, next up, <laughs> um, our next speaker, uh, probably needs no introduction, uh, is Vinay uh, Nair, who I've had the pleasure of working with uh, for the last number of years, who is the CEO and co-founder of Lightful. And he's going to um, talk about uh, what they're learning at Lightful about their capacity building programs. Thank you, Beth. Um, can I say what an honor and pleasure it is to, uh, to be on a panel following you, Beth, uh, Akriti, and Alex uh, as well. Uh, and uh, just to note this incredible amount of people who have, we've had join us today. So thank you all for, uh, for spending the time with us. and. Um, I've been very inspired already, Akriti and, and um, Alex, of what you've said, and I know I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone um, to thank you for your time. Um, many of you, I appreciate your, your warm words, uh, Beth. Many of you may know Lightful, but just to introduce uh, myself, my name is Vinay Nair. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders, along with Carlos Miranda and Johnny Moran of um, Lightful. Um, and Teresa, next slide, please, just to share a little bit more about us. Um, we're a technology company for social good, and we're delivering digital products and services uh, to amazing nonprofits, large and small, all around the world. Um, and just thinking back to what Akruthi was saying earlier as well, as nonprofits are facing this perfect storm and this downward pressure on funding and, and upward um, demand for their services, often at the front line of these multiple concurrent challenges that we have. Um, at Lightful, we tend to, to follow the advice and start with why, and we often tend to calibrate back to our why. Um, it's what drives us, um, and you know that is that we believe those doing the greatest good deserve the best technology. And, and at this time, that is something that we uh, anchor ourselves to quite a lot. And I might actually just take a quick moment um, to um, give a shout out to my truly wonderful, brilliant uh, colleagues and team. I won't run through a 50 name roll call, but I do want to just say, um, as has been pointed out by Akriti and Alex and their teams. Our team, of course, had to go through tremendous personal and professional um, change to adapt uh, and adjust to everything as it, um, as it unfolds. Um, yet every single team member um, has stepped up to serve the nonprofits we exist to serve. And uh, it's truly been inspiring. And so I want to take a public moment just to truly um, uh, acknowledge that and, and thank everyone. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, the um, really sort of starting to share our, our insights. You know, creative partnerships to respond to the moment and building on a lot of what um, has been said. I remember vividly a phone call in the middle of March. It was before we had um, lockdown. I remember it was a phone call. I remember it was, wasn't Zoom, wasn't Microsoft Teams either. I, I always have these really lame Microsoft jokes with the creepy and the team, and I find them hilarious, and literally nobody ever does. But anyway, so it wasn't Zoom, it wasn't Microsoft Teams, but it was a phone call. Um, and I spoke with a, a wonderful colleague of Alex's. Uh, Kevin Conroy, um, where we um, really realized, and I don't think we had, we might be able to find the golden thread looking back, but at the time it was just really a case of how can we do more? How can we um, acknowledge what is happening out there and pull together, you know, this philanthropic organization, this nonprofit, um, highly innovative technology uh, firms such as ourselves to, to respond. I guess to answer some of the earlier questions as well around uh, impact as well, you know, so we took um, this work that we had um, done, this very successful pilot of the, of the BRIDGE program. Um, BRIDGE stands for Building Resilience in Digital Growth and Engagement. Um, and so as Akriti was saying, a uh, 12-month program, we had these um, outcomes like 44% more funds raised, Akriti said three times greater engagement. And to answer some of the questions, we actually were supported to um, have a, our treatment group, but also control group as well. So we were indeed measuring the difference in difference so we could find the causal inference of the treatment of the program that we were um, running as well. And so having done that, it was really how could we adapt the program and move quickly and, and you know, think of other partners as well. And I remember a brilliant call we had with Asha Kern and the team at Giving Tuesday. And really, you know, we launched the COVID-19 response um, bridge program right after Giving Tuesday now happened in the middle of May, keep up that momentum. Uh, and like I say, there's some kind of wisdom in, in hindsight, perhaps, uh, of what we did, but it was really about this idea of aligning resources and skills and solutions to match needs. 
And of course, that's something we're still very much doing. Um, we're launching our next uh, cohort in partnership with Global Giving um, later this month. Uh, and of course, we're thinking, how do we respond to um, Black Lives Matters in the US um, globally? Um, a big movement in the UK here um, called Charity So White. Um, we definitely don't forget the climate emergency that we're in. Um, and you know, we're all, I know everybody on this um, Zoom will be driven by um, a, kind of a fervent sense of equity and justice. And so um, how do we, again, step up to the, the needs of the moment and do get in touch and let us know how we can all collaborate together uh, to, to create these partnerships uh, to respond accordingly. But I guess that's the kind of first piece uh, when it came to, to what we've learned um, at this time. Um, the next slide is really talking about listening and adapting. And as Beth said, data, 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 you know, clearly it, it drives us all. And I just wanted to, to maybe deconstruct a little bit what that means in practice at um, Lightful. So, you know, listening is one of Lightful's values. We pair that with leadership. We're inspired by the work of Acumen Fund and, and have that out there. And things, things have been, are, and will change so fast for the charity sector. We, and we also know, we, we crave this data and evidence upon which we can make informed decisions, but we know also that nonprofits have a lot asked of them at this time. And so how do we sort of have that data, but be understanding of what we do, and even remembering some of the power dynamics that often exist in our sector as well. So I wanted to share a few uh, insights that we're doing uh, as, uh, to, to kind of track, track that data, but also be able to remain um, uh, kind of attuned to what's needed, but not overbearing. The first example is that we, so we leveraged an existing framework that exists when it comes to um, disaster response, the three R response recovery and resilience and applied it to our program. And, you know, we really have this 12 month um, learning and doing program. That's really how we think about our capacity building work and our partnership uh, here as well. But we added in this um, kind of almost parallel concurrent track around response and recovery for three months, having that intense block to allow the nonprofits who could access topics like emergency fundraising and you know, well-being through lockdown and so on, alongside the 12 month um, resilient program. So a lot of work at the back end for us to be able to, to dual track, but I guess if you will at the front end, allowing the nonprofits to be able to access what they needed at that time, recognizing even perhaps when they um, um, kind of started on the program that, that things were changing on a daily, weekly um, basis as well. Relatedly, and second, and huge, huge credit to my wonderful uh, colleagues as well, we actually combined our application process with our baseline survey. Um, you know, we were massively oversubscribed, we were like over 500 applications in the first couple of days for the first 100 um, spots in the program. So we were really pleased to actually be able to take those insights that we were getting through a kind of combined version of a baseline survey and, um, and the application process that allowed us to adapt our three R curriculum and then the doing part with the real time information that came through as well. So we started with our view, um, got this information through and started adapting it. And, and I'll share a little bit more around what we do in a moment um, as well. Um, Third, we resolve to share as much as we can. So the data is great for us, certainly, and for us and for Global Giving and for the Gates Foundation and so on. But we know um, there is a desire, you know, 555, I think it is, data points is valuable for a lot of people. And so, you know, we've shared multiple blogs. We're having this webinar on the back of a lot of feedback, uh, wonderful feedback, and we appreciate it. We've received around creating an infographic um, just to make sure that we're kind of socializing and sharing as much of that. Um, data uh, uh, more broadly than just kind of keeping it any sense of, of proprietary just um, for us. Um, finally, I guess we're very mindful of making sure, I, I guess I share a meta perspective of adding value for the specific charity or nonprofit at every stage. And even outside of the bridge program, some of our other digital capacity work that we're doing, one with a, with a really wonderful um, corporate foundation is really thinking about how do you create that feedback loop and actually be able to provide some of the work that we are uh, able to do in almost as the quid pro quo of the time and effort spent. So for example, organizing workshops and round tables and um, diagnostic sessions with those organizations. Um, separately, again, we're organizing sort of master classes on things like storytelling that really go to what specifically will help the nonprofit. So I guess 
being as evidence-based as we can, but try to keep that um, sort of um, uh, feedback loop as closed and as, as kind of uh, flowing as much as we can. Um, my last slide really is just to talk about um, the um, technology and digital side. And um, I guess, again, in practice, what that means about leveraging technology, but keeping the human touch. I guess, you know, we've invested heavily on the tech side. You know, we have a like for learning um, platform that can be accessed at any time. We spent loads of time um, putting a lot of content on there for people to do in the middle of the night or different times and all the rest. But concurrently, we run these master classes. And, you know, Beth, for example, is our master trainer. Um, Kevin, who I mentioned earlier from Global Giving, uh, um, ran the last one around um, digital and emergency fundraising. We had an 80% attendance rate which in, out of 22 countries and time zones, all the rest, shows that craving and desire for community and being, you know, we sometimes get over, overwhelmed by the sort of sense of gratitude we get back. And not just us with the organizations, but seeing the peer-to-peer -peer piece um, that's happened. That's been one of the best parts of previous uh, programs that we've done um, as well. And really seeing how those outcomes that we are getting, and, and um, Akruthi talked about some of them around, uh, the engagement and the dollars, cents, or pounds and pence, and so on that we raise. There's an important one as well around confidence that I just wanted to mention. Um, and you know, that's something that we really do. And, and it's so far from any kind of soft, fluffy, qualitative sort of thing. Rather, you know, we know that the vital need to, to support the often it can be lonely, um, it can be isolating to be, be really able to um, offer that support. And you know, we run a wonderful RM relationship management team run these digital drop-ins. Um, so thinking about those outcomes, quantitative, qualitative, but actually, you know, we measure that uh, at baseline, midline, endline as well to also see how that increases the pilot that Akruthi mentioned, we saw a 25% increase, for example. And so I think by keeping the technology in human touch, you know, it can flow the other way as well. Our one-on-ones that the team do often end up being on smart goals and that's fed into our product roadmap so now we're building a feature in our platform that allows the nonprofit to create the smart goals. So again, trying to think of that technology human uh, interplay and having it feed both ways. And I think if we can remember that, we know technology can unleash huge waves of, of greater impact. If we can remember to stay human and intersperse the two together, that's a big lesson of what, what we are learning at Lightful along with our partners and one that remains um, vital here. So thank you from me uh, and Beth, I hope we have some time now Oh, this is our new team photo, by the way, that is, uh, that is our kind of Zoom, but we did anyway, because uh, we can't, we miss each other. Uh, but anyway, um, so that's it for me, Beth, over to you. Now. Great, great. Thank you so much, Vinay, Alex, and Akruti uh, for your presentations. And we're going to shift into a uh, moderated discussion Q&A. And I'm going to kick it off with um, a question for each of you um, to, to, to perhaps answer uh, very briefly, um, sort of rapid fire to start. Um, so the, the Grant Makers for Effective um, Organizations uh, recently uh, released a landscape analysis about the best practices of capacity building. And these are all types of capacity building. And so they, they coined a phrase, it's something uh, about best practices called the three C's, um, that uh, you know, well done capacity programs are continuous, collective, and contextual. I'm wondering if you could each share a few thoughts uh, related to one of these areas. And I think we're particularly interested in the contextual, given the recent focus on social justice and racial equity um, and all the pivoting that we're doing. So I'm going to uh, shoot this one to Vinay first. <laughs> sure, that's a great question. I've seen that GeoFunder landscape analysis has been very helpful, actually. Um, as, we, as I mentioned, we're currently kind of thinking as well for this next cohort that we're doing with. Um, Alex and the team at Global Giving uh, as well. So I guess we think of it at a couple of different levels. We think of it in terms of some of the funders that we partner with, um, where understanding some of their contextual needs and how they're thinking about um, the framework of what we have and how it can be adapted for specific um, groups. In some cases, we're working with organizations working directly around racial justice. And after the, you know, the murder of George Floyd, we've seen a lot of our, our charity partners um, really deeply involved in this in a direct basis. A lot of that can be around support, around storytelling, an effective call to action, like what is the next call to action piece that you have. But you know, it, or we also though think those organizations working directly, there may, I think frankly, everyone, you know, at Lightful we have this conversation a lot as well. Every organization I hope um, sh should be, and I hope actually, really I think it's quite amazing, is. So, you know, in the COVID example, we saw that 
95% um, of organizations said that they were directly impacted or immediately responding to COVID, but only 10% were actually working in healthcare. And so I think similarly in other issues like racial justice and social justice, when we start getting that data and insights, it's not just as organizations directly working in it, but also in the kind of ancillary areas as well, that we can kind of adapt, understand the funder piece, understand the direct and indirect piece, and then be able to respond, and as you say, that third seed, the contextualization as well. That's great. Alex, do you have anything to add to that? Maybe in um, the, the a collective area or, or uh, continuous. <laughs> Sure. Oh, I was going to talk about contextual, but maybe I can uh, I can make a link to go all ahead. Three go of ahead. These go because, ahead. Well, go they, I mean, they, they all. Um, I think they're all relevant to capacity building, and um, I think in each case, I, I can share the story of what we're doing at Global Giving briefly, which is that you know even as an organization with a black CEO, a relatively diverse board, um, we um, still have not. Um, sort of rested comfortably in our response here. And so what we've started with is introspection um, in ourselves um, in response to this really, um, in some ways, quite helpful focus on, on racial injustice. And we are actively thinking about right now, and we're engaged in this process now, about how do we change what we do and, and the way that we work with our nonprofit partners uh, in a way that actually improves our own um, uh, norms around diversity and openness and justice. Uh, because I think that, you know, while we're quite proud of the work that we've done, we also have taken this moment to recognize we also have a lot of work to do ourselves. We have a lot of work to do in terms of diversity of our staff and then also the implicit biases that are built into our our everyday practices in the way in the way that we communicate with our nonprofit partners, and so, you know, in thinking about contextualizing, um, it's not just sort of contextualizing at the surface level, sort of what we're talking about in our capacity building programs. It's going all the way back and thinking about sort of root <clears throat> root attitudes um, within ourselves, and then also the modes of communication and the norms that we've established that are sort of this. Um, meta level through, through which the you know capacity building programs are are delivered. Right. So uh, we don't have the answers there, but we know that we're doing that work now. So I, so I hear a kind of re reflection um, on your internal culture and um, and really uh, uh, responding um, not just with uh, pro programmatic, but so it's really institutionalized um, anti racism, if you will. I'll say that word. Um, Akriti, anything to add? Yeah, the, the one C that stuck out for me was the, the continuous. I think from the lens of a funder, what I hear the most is gratitude that we, we do often provide multi-year grants. And we have strategies that, of course, they get tweaked and refined, you know, on a somewhat regular basis, but they don't change year on year. What I've heard from a lot of grantees is, Funding is often sporadic, a one-off, the strategy shifts, the program officer changes. And so the, having that consistency and that continuity is really important for nonprofits. And um, taking my Gates Foundation hat off and um, looking at this from the perspective of a nonprofit, uh, I joined the board of a nonprofit in 2018. Um, it was my first experience doing so. It's very healthy, uh, did a healthy 60 million in revenue. So a very large organization. And even at that size, with the grants that they have from USAID, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, other institutional funders, at the end of the day, their restricted, um, unrestricted funding was still small. And every year it was still a uh, challenge to meet the budget. And, and so I can only imagine how difficult for an organization of that size struggling um, with capacity building to invest in technology, to invest in data, um, how difficult it was for them, for, for nonprofits even smaller, how difficult it must be for, for them. Great, thank you for that. Um, there's some questions here about measuring impact um, and they're kind of more a few of them are kind of on the how, but I would, and I think we could have spent a whole webinar just on how to measure impact, maybe a whole day symposium, but I would really love to hear from each of you to lift up an insight that you've learned from this data um, that applies to either how to deliver 
um, an impactful capacity program during this during the weird time that we're in, or else maybe some insights around um, the thing that probably the elephant that's in the room here. How do I increase, you know, donations? <laughs> so um, how do I get, um, how, you know, how do I get more um, more donations? How do I get donors to give? And I know Alex um, gave us one, <laughs> which was you know empathy and messaging. And I'm wondering maybe speak kick that kick us off with maybe speaking to that and anything else you would like to add. Sure, to, to me? Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, another thing that I would um, add is that, um, and maybe this goes to sort of my last slide about, about doing things that um, you've not done before. Um, we've really opened the doors to new kinds of partners funding new kinds of initiatives. Um, so for example, you know, we launched, uh, one of our biggest projects has been with um, uh, the Spanx Foundation, um, Sarah Blakely, um, who, who founded uh, Spanx Foundation, um, or you know, founded the company Spanx um, around a program to support uh, female entrepreneurs. It's something that we've not done before, um, but um, sort of stretched us in a way that caused us to learn new ways and new sources of, of um, grant dollars that were available. Um, uh, and so, and an interesting thing about that program is that it actually um, draws a lot from the initial micro grant program that we had, where you know it was just a thousand dollars to um, you know to, to organizations in, in response to their need. You know, uh, because Sarah started this uh, company with five thousand dollars, she decided to give grants of five thousand dollars to to female entrepreneurs. Um, so so I think that it's been a combination of both of, of that for us, which is. Um, hewing closely to the actual needs um, that our um, grantees are expressing, not being shy to share them, and then thinking creatively and really trying to develop new partnerships in terms of funding partnerships and new programs and sort of working hard. Uh, our partnerships team in particular has been working overtime, I have to say. All right. uh, so really getting into that reinvention um, stage of after the pivot, after the reaction. React, um, you know, changing something, but really thinking of something bold and new. And, and then doing of, new things, yeah. Doing new things and not being scared to do it. <laughs> and probably with some evidence base there so that you are gather, gathering data around these new things to making sure they're effective. Um, Akruti, I know uh, Gates Foundation has invested a lot in uh, research just on this question. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could share, you know, pick out a few like hot insights around uh, increasing um, more donations, bigger or, or better giving. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think this is the age old question for most of us in the sector, right? How do you measure impact? Um, for us on our team, when we talk about giving more and giving better, the more is really easy, right? It's measuring the dollars. Um, the better then opens a can of worms of, well, what do we mean by better? What to what types of organizations? Um, to how do you measure effectiveness of a direct uh, service provider versus like an advocacy organization? There are all these kind of apples to oranges comparisons that makes it very difficult. Um, so in terms of just some of the, the insights that, that we have found in terms of what can drive up some donations um, to kind of cut to the chase, um, I would encourage uh, those of you that haven't, uh, that aren't familiar with Ideas 42. They are a uh, nonprofit behavioral consulting group that is a, a grantee of ours. And through the grant to them, uh, they work with a lot of various giving platforms to test different types of messaging, different types of concepts to donors to better understand what can increase giving. Um, a couple insights from some of the work with them include. Um, you know, there's this idea that often if a donor is looking to experience, uh, to invest in a new cause area. So let's say you usually give to women and girls organizations, but you've never given to climate. Then you try to Google like climate organizations and you don't know how to sift through the millions of things that come up. Um, so how can someone help a, a donor narrow that, uh, those choices and, and feel confident that they're giving to a well-vetted, good organization. Um, and so in one of the research reports, Ideas 42 found that um, this is more geared toward these intermediary organizations, as I mentioned. Um, 
if someone reduces uh, giving opportunities down to a list of five, donors are more likely to click and give um, through that list versus a list of 10, 15, 20, 100 um, list of organizations. So there are all these kind of small things that you can, you can do and, and uh, insights you can draw from behavioral science that you might be able to utilize in your own organization. That's great. Thank you so much. And for those of you who are wondering, uh, where do I get a hold of that research? I think if you Google Ideas42, I believe that it's on their site and they make it available. And they've done um, actually a number of presentations in the sector. And I'm going to throw one last question to Vinay before we close. Um, given that this, that both you and Alex are pretty much working with digital first capacity building programs where it was imagined to be delivered online and at scale as opposed to face to face and a smaller group. And we have a lot of organizations kind of pivoting <laughs> uh, or, or being uh, or going um, faster on digital transformation than they had initially um, uh, thought. So what's your, you know, practical advice to the, those that are like, <laughs> how do we do this? How do we do it? Well, you know, what could, what can you tell them to like save them some time in this uh, yeah, journey? <laughs> wonderful question. So I would say, um, I'd, I'd say there are a couple of things. Um, one is, I think, you know, and actually, even if I reflect on the, the couple of slides that I shared, assessing needs and understanding is important. And you can um, go at various levels of depth of that, but actually understanding where nonprofits are, I think, is very, very valuable. Start your group of grantees, maybe one program officer has a certain interest in a certain cause area or in a certain geography. You know, violence against women and girls is something that we're doing a lot of work on. Um, homelessness, something else we do work on, but then we do different geographies and so on. So understanding the needs as it pertains either across the board or specific cut by sector or geography is a great start. I think, um, I think this idea of learning and doing is really valuable and there are digital tools that are out there um, to allow you to not just sort of do a course and then you kind of have it for a while and then it dissipates, but actually how do you create that mechanism to support organizations to put some of that into practice. And, you know, a lot of people are on their phones or on their computers, increasingly so. Um, so actually, what is the way that you can encourage that learning and doing? I think that is a useful lens through which you can do it. Um, I guess as a technology company, uh, I, my final point would be is like leverage the technology that exists as it then can serve you, you know, as the means rather than the ends. Sometimes we conflate those two. Um, the technology to be able to understand, okay, well, I'm looking to help uh, support organizations to achieve this X outcome. How can I use digital technology tools to help sort of achieve that? So I think, um, you know, um, my former boss at Acumen Fund, Jacqueline Nevergas, just written her second book. There's a plug, I'm happy to do it. Um, but, you know, she has a great term of start and let the work teach you. And I think given everything that we're going through now, I think there's a lot to be said for, for that advice as well. Great. So kind of like uh, do measure learn, if you will. And so I think we're coming up uh, to the end. And um, I, I want to mention again, this is uh, being recorded. Uh, the slides will be available. There'll, there'll be links to different resources. There are a lot of specific questions about the resources. So all of that will come probably in a follow-up email to all participants. So I'm going to turn it over to Vinay to close. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody, uh, for joining us. Um, Beth, for your wonderful uh, moderation as always and being a, a great advisor, senior advisor to the Lightful and to me as well. Um, like I said at the start, Akriti and, and Alex, I think when we, uh, when we speak I feel inspired but actually even through this webinar I feel that sense of a call to arms to do even more uh, and I'm sure that will be reflected across the board. So this is going to take all of us. Uh, please do get in touch. We'll share all of that information. Thanks for joining us um, and let's, let's do our best to, uh, with Hamilton coming out tomorrow, our best to rise up. Thank you very much everyone for